name is Jack Kenning, and I'm the Secretary for the Foundation for Restoration of St. Jeremy. Thank you again, everybody, for attending. Our next speaker this afternoon is Don Strand. Don is an independent researcher with Family Ties and Historic St. Jeremy. He grew up in the state of Oregon, lived for a while in France, and moved to California where he raised his family. He was in the financial industry for 25 years and now works with inner city youth at Alive and Free, a violence prevention program in San Francisco. While doing family genealogy research, Don discovered his grandmother was African American and born in St. Genevieve, Missouri. He later learned that his great great grandmother was enslaved, fell in love with a French nobleman's son, and eventually obtained her freedom. Don was excited about sharing this intriguing story with students everywhere. I first became acquainted with Don in, in 2013 when he reached out to the Foundation for the Restoration of St. Genevieve uh, to assist him in a special project he wanted to pursue. This project led to the creation of the educational website www.amhouse.org and the iPad app www.amhouse.org slash app and today encourages young people to learn more about their family history. In 2015, Don made a moving presentation at our history conference, Roots Matter, Discovering Pelagi Amaro. Today, Don will share with us the journey of Suzette, an enslaved woman born again in St. Genevieve. Please welcome my friend Don Strand, who will present Suzette and the Above Ground Railroad. Thank you, Thank you, um, it was an introduction that some of that, if I repeat it in my paper, you understand, because I wasn't sure how much information you were going to be given. But uh, I, uh, I always love being back in this town. And, and the more time I spend here, the more friends I, I make. Uh, and I just feel so fortunate to, uh, and I feel like I'm honored to be asked to, to speak at a conference like this. So thank you. Uh, I hope you don't mind if I indulge a little bit before I do my paper. Uh, I woke up at 5 this morning, and uh, my mind was racing, was thinking about what I was going to present, and all of a sudden, for some reason, I've come here for a number of years, back and forth, and uh, and it sort of hit me for the first time as I, I work with inner city youth, and it hit me sort of the connection between the kids that we're working with and St. Genevieve architecture, and it was uh, so. So when the kids come to us. Uh, most cases, because of the trauma they're involved in, uh, their pants are sagging, their head's down, their hat's down, so you can't see their face a lot of times. Everything has this, this strong, sort of heavy weight. And, and most importantly, their smile is gone. And so when the smile is gone and they have these images, uh, they're starting to be seen as dangerous. So if they have all these things going on, then people are told, stay away, you know, it's, she's dangerous. And, uh, and then after that, they sort of become invisible. Um, and I just reflected back just today, or, or yesterday, the day before yesterday, I was walking down Main Street and then go, you know, continuing north. And uh, over the years, I've, I've noticed the, uh, is it the Burke House or Birch? Burke House. Burke House. And so over time, I've kind of watched that too. And, and uh, at one time, it looked like it was about to collapse. It had this weight. It was, I wanted to go in, but it looked dangerous. I, I kind of wanted to avoid uh, being near it. And, uh, I, and then as I've come each time, they started to peel the layers off. And as they peel the layers off, it has this magnificent structure inside. And I, it's just the same kind of work that we do is we peel away the layers from these kids that look dangerous and they stay away. And so for me, this was quite uh, amazing to see that you guys work so hard at keeping these structures and how important it is to, to absolutely, to be able to express how important a structure is inside of these buildings. So anyway, I, uh, I, 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 I put that connection together today and, and uh, Sometimes you wonder why you're doing this work, and I'm always coming up with things that I, uh, surprise me. So, uh, so today, um, uh, yeah, I want to present Suzette and the Above Ground Railroad. Uh, the thing I found uh, most 
fascinating about St. Genevieve is that everything is in its place as it was at the turn of the 18th century. The rivers, the fields, the houses, the buildings, the original layout of the town, and many descendants of the original settlers are still here. And now there's a national historical park here in St. Gen, thanks to the unrelenting efforts of many unrelenting townspeople who believe this town had an important story to tell to show that the Creole Corridor is an essential part of a more complete American story. On a little side note, uh, when I was doing my research, I came upon I came upon this article, and I don't know if people have seen it, but it just happens to be, this year happens to be the 75th anniversary of the <coughs> National Park Service first tour to St. Genevieve. And so I thought this was so amazing because I was thinking, wow, St. Genevieve people are really patient. <laughs> <laughs> and also really unrelenting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yet in, in my experience, this town is more than a designation. It's a place for the world to see the naissance, the birth of American culture, with all its beauty and its ugliness, and all its suffering and celebration, all its richness, and a spirit that gives it its strength. We all have been gifted a legacy and responsibility to tell the American story in its truest form, using every authentic lens available, so the visitor's experience is not just a note on the music sheet, but a recognizable tune we all hum as we leave. Several layers of St. Genevieve history have been written about, and now we're discovering more fascinating layers. I'd like to share with you today one such layer about a woman named Suzette Mary, who was enslaved at birth and fought to reclaim her freedom above ground in the public courts of St. Louis, three decades before the Dred Scott decision. This is quite a journey, a journey of a, a new American family. Suzette was born in St. Genevieve in 1801 uh, at birth, she was enslaved by, which you can see he, the sclav right there, the, the signature under her name. She was, uh, she was born uh, with, uh, she was baptized with the name of Judith, and uh, then she joins her other 17 members of the family, uh, also who were enslaved, uh, to live behind the Vital Beauvais house uh, next to the barnyard. So slavery is a horrifying circumstance, a condition that tries to make Suzette's young uh, life miserable at best, but slavery didn't define her. As I've come to know Suzette better, I believe she doesn't really worry about how things really are. She moves through life. She doesn't accept her circumstance, and she moves through it. We see how this plays out further in her story. However, as Suzette's one fear, a universal fear, uh, perhaps we all have, is for those particularly that are enslaved or without authority and separation from family. There can be no greater human terror than separation. This fear must have always been on her mind. So in 1816, when Suzette is 15, her enslaver dies. The immeasurable terror appears. Suzette's family is about to be torn apart by one document. Her enslaver's estate deed. These are the names of Suzette's family uh, <coughs> that she is, uh, that, that they're either through blood or adoption. These 17 others are most likely the only family Suzette has ever known. So this is obviously a transcription of the actual document, but we can see the different uh, names here within the family, different ages, and the different values. Uh, and listed, uh, obviously, because uh, seen as, as human property. Uh, we don't have photos of Suzette's family, so no basis that we can remember. But I imagine them looking somewhat like this. And I had to take certain pictures because I, I don't want to lose a sense of images of, of human experience here. I think that a lot of times we look at documents like that and 
and even though these aren't in the family, I, I wanted to have some kind of sense of, of what the emotion might be. So some of the family stays with the enslavers, widows, and, and others are, are given uh, in, in twos, and some uh, of their, some have to say their final goodbyes. And I also just sort of again add this picture too, because I think that, that we forget that kids do feel terror and do feel separation. Uh, and I think that that's what was taking place when the family broke apart. And I know that that was somewhat uh, accepted in a sense because they were seeing the human property. They were trying to again get to the, to the lens of, of, of this family. So Suzette is, uh, is separated and goes alone with the other family members. She's removed from Missouri and then taken to Cahokia. Um, now this map is older, but I guess since it's uh, 1817, it's okay to have St. Genevieve uh, on the map. <laughs> uh, so she's taken to Cahokia and Illinois, and then Slaver's eldest daughter, Julia, uh, and her husband, Mrs. Uh take her to uh, their house. Uh, once Suzette is seen as residing in Illinois, she's legally free, according to the Northwest Ordinance in 1787, but the droves are, are extremely wealthy. And uh, the top of, uh, uh, wealthy. And, and on top of this, uh, Nicholas Droves is not only an attorney, but a judge. So he knows the law very well. He knows Suzette is legally free. So he gets her to sign an indenture for 50 years. <laughs> And on this, you can see in the writing of this document, uh, he says uh, she signs of her own free will. But of course, we know in that time she can't read or write because it was illegal. But this is her ex and her, her name down here. The document for 50 years, so she remains enslaved and retains her market value. Because Suzette is not allowed to read or write, she can't read the document. And her circumstance is slavery. But she continues to live her life, and I want to highlight this, is that, is that slavery is really a circumstance, it's a condition. But, but my, my understanding of, of seeing these documents and understanding as you draw from your part of the story, that there's something else that was propelling her to live life. It wasn't just locked down to say slavery, there was something that surpassed this. So what she did was, she falls in love with Jean-Marie, John Mary, as he's called, a man who's also enslaved, and they marry. And this is the doc. This is the document, the marriage document here. And underlying, you can see Judith Paquette. So she goes back to her baptized name. And a lot of times, enslaved people were called names that maybe they weren't at her birth name. And we don't know why, but we can we can somewhat understand. But now she's not an official document. She goes back to Judith. And interestingly, she uses Paquette. And at first I thought, wow, well, maybe that she's related to the Kett family and such. But I did a lot of research on that. And my sense is that the Kett had nothing to do with any slavery that she was, she was held by. So at some level, maybe there was a sense that she felt free with that, with that, uh, with that last name. So in, uh, so the marriage, so this is on the marriage registry. She uses the baptized name. And interestingly, she chooses the name the Kett. So I, I want to do more research on the Kett family, but I found that fascinating. So a couple years later, uh, they have a son, John Marie. So they call him John Marie Jr. Again, he's born into slavery. You can see a slob there. Uh, and, and they continue to build the, uh, the family. So she falls, uh, she, um, uh, so they start, they start to, create a new family, a strong family that they call the Mary family. Uh, perhaps not such a, an ironic name, as even slavery couldn't disrupt their merriment within their own family. So was this in Cahokia? Pardon me? Yeah, it's Cahokia. Yeah. So Suzette is living in a world attempting, attempting <coughs> to control all of what she does. A place, but in all of, of, of who she is, but there's an inner spirit that no enslaver can control. A place inside where there is no fear. Uh, and it's pretty certain, in my opinion, that Suzette didn't show her heart to anyone except the folks that she was very close to. That year in 1820, 
their enslaver, Jero, dies. And <clears throat> when he dies, after he dies, the fear, of course, of separation comes. But in this case, they, uh, the, uh, the, she, the family was uh, sold together and is passed on to the first, uh, and the next enslaver, which happens to be the brother-in-law of Jero. And then she's passed on to another enslaver. But I think that what, what's taking place here is as she's being passed from enslaver to enslaver, uh, uh, the family stays intact at some level, uh, which is important because that's the sense of where she finds her power. Are they all in Illinois? Pardon me? Are all these people in Illinois? Yeah, so we're still in Illinois here. I know there's a lot to follow here too because the, the, the story gets kind of complicated from here. So he's a very well-connected uh, enslaver. Um, very powerful family and, uh, and, and that comes out in, in, in the rest of the story. So, Billy? Yes. I'm confused. She, he got her to sign a paper of in, being indentured. Yes. So after his death for 50 years. So I'm, I'm not that familiar with what happens to someone who's indentured after the person who owns those papers dies? Can I didn't know what that you could sell someone on to another person, sell services to someone else? Yeah, my understanding is that's what keeps her value. So the indenture is passed on. And again, I don't go as deep as you all do, but I do go pretty deep. And my experience is that. That's what kept the market value. So the indenture, since it's illegal to enslave uh, in Illinois at the time, but you can indenture, then then you're, they're tra they're trapped into enslavement for that time. And so when when they're sold to somebody else, well, they're indentured, value. right? Because the value for McCracken, for example, is nine hundred dollars. I'm a little bit confused. Her her name was Judith originally. Then she went by. Suzette. Suzette, and then when she married, she was Judith. Right. So how did you make these connections? Was it through a mention of her parents' names, or that yeah. she could prove that Judith and Suzanne were the, Suzette were the same person? Yeah, it's pretty, I mean, it, so this is all written, a lot of this is written in a, in a book, and uh, by Leah Vanderbilt. And this is how I came upon it, was really I read her book, and it opened up this whole story, and then I, did all the first-hand research. I want to see the documents. I want to confirm everything is true. And so she follows along. She's, uh, she's quite an accomplished uh, uh, professor in Iowa. And, uh, and so she started following all these documents. And you can see that when, when uh, uh, Vital Bode dies, uh, the estate is broken up. And, and on the, her estate uh, is Suzette. And she, now I'm I gotta get my mind around this. So Suzette is uh, is connected to the name Judith because we know that she marries John uh, John Mary when they're when they're married. So they see Judith going with um, with uh, uh, with shit, I know all these names. I'm sorry. With Nicholas Giroux's daughter, I mean Nicholas Giroux's uh, wife who is Julia Beauvais, okay, I'm sorry. So they go Julia Beauvais, and then they trace her to the documents with Nicholas Giroux. She gets going by Suzette with him, especially when she's been transferring, and Judith is the name she's on these documents. So now we confirm Judith and Suzette are the, are the same person. And it'll show up later on, you'll see Judith and Suzette back and forth, but if you see the trail for the husband, it all, so uh, uh, <clears throat> a few months later, the enslaver not only keeps, uh, so, so what happens is John, sorry, in 1825, Suzette's husband John makes a financial contract uh, with their enslaver to, to uh, reclaim their freedom for their family. John pays the enslaver part of the sum and is allowed to go to St. Louis to earn the balance to buy their freedom. But a witness, says that the enslaver had always intended and felt the right to cheat John out of his money. 
So a few months later, the enslaver not only keeps John's money, he also rips <coughs> John away from his family, has him jailed, chains him, and these are all in documents, chains him and sends him downriver to be sold for additional money in New Orleans. So John is far away from his family and enslaved on a plantation just outside of New Orleans. So separation, and that's my sense when I was studying, is that you always hear the, the screams and cries of the family up north. Yet I also imagine John is also thinking about his next plan. Sure enough, John escapes from the plantation. And we know he, the risk he was taking in escaping, especially if we've seen 12 years a slave. Uh, he travels back up river, which is an you know, enormous task. I mean, 700 miles just getting up there, and that's a whole potential story in itself. But, but he makes it, uh, he travels all the way up river, a physical and mental task that, again, may be unimaginable for us today. The physicality of the journey and the risk for a black man without freedom papers in hand is incomprehensible. But he makes it up to Illinois and rejoins his family, uh, who have been sold to yet another enslaver. So Suzette and John are, are captives, yet they continue to build their family together. They have a daughter, Angelique, and now they are a family of four. Then John's previous enslaver, the one who sold him down river, sees John and has him arrested by this sheriff. And the sheriff jails John in St. Louis, and then the enslaver sells him to two merchants. But when the merchants bail John out so they can sell John down river again, John escapes their control and files suit against them in, in St. Louis uh, civil court. John's case is one of 300 freedom suits filed in St. Louis prior to the Civil War. These cases have been written about in books by Leah Vanderbilt and Kelly Kennington, court cases of African-American plaintiffs standing in public courtrooms face to face with their captors, looking them straight in the eye and risking their lives for their freedom. This is what I see as the above ground railroad, a network of enslaved people secretly passing along the knowledge and law of the court system, and then publicly taking enslavers to court, one after another after another, like rail cars on an above ground railroad, going through the mountain. But what does it take to stand face to face with someone determined to take your freedom, or your family, or your life? Bravery, faith, determination, resilience. In John's case, he is suing an enslaver who has financial resources and a very forceful network of friends. There's a lot of risk for him. Yet John takes his case to civil court anyway. He loses in civil court, but he appeals and wins in, in the state of Missouri Supreme Court. John is free. But Suzette and her children are still enslaved. So Suzette learns uh, about the legal system from having experience it and waits for her own moment of opportunity to join the above ground railroad train, moving toward freedom. Suzette and John have their third child. They continue to build a family even though Suzette and her three children are still enslaved. Suzette and her children are now enslaved by a man named John Reynolds, their fifth enslaver. Reynolds is a very well-connected, well-known man. He knows the law better than most. He's been an attorney and a judge. He's one of the first four justices of the Illinois Supreme Court. And at this point in time, He's a member of the Illinois House of Representatives. He's in a very politically powerful position. And two years from this time, he'll be the fourth governor of the state of Illinois. This is who enslaves Suzette and her children. So what can Suzette do? 
escaped from her family who had cost her husband's freedom and put it in jeopardy. And suing Reynolds would be would involve unimaginable risk. So what did she do? She joined the Above Ground Railroad in St. Louis courtroom where she filed suit against Reynolds to retain her freedom. And this is the document of her filing. So Suzette, alias Judith, we get another confirmation here that show up. I kind of sometimes forget where I found all this, but I know it's there. Um, so we haven't come across a photo of Suzette yet, another issue about families, but this image is what I imagine her to look like. Her sort of settled in posture, her expression, she's looking someone straight in the eye. And she then files suit against Reynolds, also for each of her three children. No longer invisible, for me, she's publicly saying, I'm here. Her level of courage is almost inconceivable. Suing your enslaver in public courtroom, risking your life, risking violence on your kids, facing judges and juries of all white men. So what happens? Reynolds is summoned to show up in court, a defendant in these suits. But this very well-known man can't be found. <laughs> He's a member of the Illinois House of Representatives, <laughs> but he can't be found. <laughs> it's, uh, so then I would ask myself, is, is not found, is it the literal truth or is it convenient truth? <laughs> yeah. After the one and only summons, which is unusual, Suzette and her children are kidnapped and they disappear. Then Suzette's husband, John, remember, a free man, freed by the Missouri Supreme Court decision, is also kidnapped. It makes me wonder if John is kidnapped and imprisoned for liberating himself. He's sent down river again. He's a captive to the same Louisiana plantation owner as before. So John is enslaved down south in Louisiana, on the Louisiana plantation. Suzette and their children are captive somewhere in Illinois. As we discover, perhaps not surprisingly, that Suzette's two kidnappers are family friends of the soon-to-be governor. Here's one of the kidnappers. The kidnapping case is so clear that the Missouri Grand Jury indicts the kidnappers. The kidnapping indicts the kidnappers not only for kidnapping, but also for conspiracy. Yes, yeah. Why did, why did they file suit in St. Louis when it was all in only one hour? You know what, that's a great question. I knew it at one point, and it's in, the, it's in uh, Lear or Kelly's book. But I think these, this is the beginning of, of, of American law at the time. And that, that kind of gets as part of the story, because why are these people coming from a, from a free state and trying to get their freedom in yeah. the court system in St. Louis? And somebody may be able to answer it. I, I can't well, give I think, you know, if you were a free person in Illinois and they came over to Missouri, that's when they would be re-enslaved. Mm -hmm. There was some of that going on. So they're, they're not well, being enslaved in Illinois, they're being enslaved in Missouri. Well, th that's what's the, the, the crazy risk, too, is that even coming over to file a court, you know, somebody get kidnapped because you're always, you're human property. When you're valuing this. When they were enslaved by Reynolds, were they living in Missouri or Illinois? They were, they were living in Illinois. So they were across the river, and all these suits, these 300 suits that they write about, all take place in, in St. Louis. And they come from Illinois as well as Missouri. But I should know that. I know that was I knew that question because that's a critical component. But I, I'd rather pass on that answer and, and get the, the correct information. Was it federal court, not state court? No, it was state court. Yeah. So there wouldn't have been a legal issue in Illinois. There was no such thing as slavery. So they would have to go to a state that had slavery, had the issue, could debate the issue. Yeah, that's 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 a, that's a great point. Yeah, and yet people were still enslaving people in Illinois, even though it was illegal. But that's pro that's right. You have to go to a slave state to have that kind of court. But I, I you know, I'm I'm not. Yeah, I'm not completely sure. Um, yes. Research and Restoration, there was a case of a woman with a man, person who 
had her sign as, as indentured to him for many, many years. Uh, when he died, the son tried to take, take her. And she said, no, I'm out of here. And uh, they went and uh, one of the attorneys at the time, and this is in Illinois, Randolph County, and of course at the time um, had been the Supreme Court, and not at the time of that though, but in, the, in that court. And they went through the attorney. They said because she did not know how to read and write when this indenture was given, that and it was entirely unreasonable for so many years, and the court really freed her. Mm. So the son did not get to take her. So that there was instances of that also. And was that in St. Louis? In Illinois, in as, Illinois. as an unreasonable indenture. Yeah. Maybe huh. it was just proximity because they were in they were just in Cahokia, right? So yeah. Yeah, across the river. But there is, there is, I mean, I, I should have, yeah, I should have, I, because I thought about that on the plane. I didn't bring the book, but I uh, but I know it's a critical point. But but I think Jan's answer may have been uh, close to the to the answer here. So so here we have the grand jury has, uh, yeah. Um, okay, so the grand jury indicts the, the, the two kidnappers and, uh, and the two kidnappers are, uh, are summons uh, by the, uh, the St. Louis court. And so this is the first summons in 1829, then they're summoned again in, uh, in later in 1829, summoned again in, <laughs> later in 1829. Well, again, it's all not found. So, uh, and these are really well known uh, People in the community. Who were so, they? Pardon me? What were their names? So these are uh, 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 Jacob Judy and Moses Whiteside. So, so Jacob Judy and Moses Whiteside. Yeah. So uh, so anyway, they're uh, they're they're eventually uh, knocked down four times, and uh, the case is is uh, dismissed, and and the family again. Uh, disappears. So John is enslaved down south on the on Louisiana plantation. Suzette and their children are captured somewhere up in Illinois. And discovered perhaps not surprising that Suzette's two captives are found. Okay, grand jury. Suzette and her children are enslaved in Illinois, and meanwhile Suzette's husband John is found. Sorry, John doesn't escape from the plantation this time. Uh, so now he's okay. Okay, let's take a deep breath. So Suzette has disappeared, the family's all gone, the kids are still, they're up somewhere up in there, we think about uh, Galena, Illinois. John is, is down here on the plantation again. And this time, uh, instead of escaping, he chooses uh, the same strategy as he did in Missouri. Uh, he takes his captors to court so in Louisiana. So John's case is so clear, he wins immediately in Louisiana civil court. But the enslaver appeals, the decision and it has John held in New Orleans jail for several months because he came, he claims John is, let's see, he was very much addicted to running away. <laughs> and that probably, somebody has just put new notions of this kind in his head. So that's the way they can hold him enslaved uh, uh, down in Louisiana. But John wins the appeal, but is enslaved, further detains his enslaver until the case goes to the Louisiana Supreme Court. Finally, in 1830, John wins his case and receives his freedom. So here it says, too, is clearly entitled to his freedom. And over here, it talks about the Northwest Ordinance uh, as being, you know, one of the precedents of why he is uh, is won his case. So John has to obviously uh, he's won his freedom decision in both Missouri and, and and Louisiana Supreme Courts now. What irony that he's won two decisions in two slave states to win his freedom in a free state. He makes his way back up river to search for his family. We see John has made it back to, to St. Louis and believe that he is waiting for some key moment to be able to reunite with his family. 
Suzette is with her children across the river in Galena, Illinois, enslaved by their sex enslaver. It's now 1831, and Suzette's son, John Mary Jr., who's about 11 years old, is told by his enslaver that he's taken to Washington, D.C. But John Jr. knows the enslaver actually intends to sell him downriver in New Orleans. So what does John Jr. do? As the boat docks in St. Louis, John Jr. jumps ship and files suit <laughs> in the public courts of the St. Louis courthouse. We see that his mother, Suzette, and again the ex, it says Susan, uh, and there's no other Susan that shows up in his life in some case, uh, makes her mark as a person who's part of the, the court documents. So we see Suzette with him in court. She leaves her ex uh, on this uh, on the document. Uh, the court process takes about a year, but in 1832, at age 12, John Mary Jr. wins his, his case. Uh, the enslaver is found guilty. Uh, the said defendant is guilty. And John Jr. is awarded one cent in damages. But it's one cent, right? So that's an important one cent. And John Jr. becomes the second generation to board the train of the above ground railroad. This is so significant. We see the second generation to board the train, taking people to court who illegally enslave free people. In fact, their cases, the Mary family, and others who file suit, was so threatening to their enslavers losing their human property, we begin to see new laws enacted to try to disrupt the past to reclaiming freedom. A lot has happened to the Mary family. John is legally free, yet never fully safe. We know John Jr. has gained his freedom, and Suzette reunites with them in St. Louis. For the consideration of time, I've chosen to leave out many of the character details of the enslavers, and there's a lot left to imagine about the repercussions of the Mary family had to face in, for taking enslavers to court, <coughs> along with the difficult journeys up and down the river. So how does this all end for the Mary family? At this point, they're gathering in St. Louis. John is free. John Jr. has won his freedom as well. And Suzette may still be indentured. We don't know. But they all reunite as a family in St. Louis. We have yet to find out where Suzette's other children, Angelique and Edmund, end up. We see that Suzette's husband, John, is finally a free man. But sadly, he suddenly dies in St. Louis. His sudden death is suspicious enough to require a coroner's inquest. The result of the inquest? Inconclusive. It says, John Mary's cause of death by the visitation of the Almighty. <laughs> John's death uh, came after winning two Supreme Court decisions, one in St. Louis and one in New Orleans. He was no longer considered marketable human property at either end of the trade route, an accomplishment that may have cost him his life, but ended slavery in Illinois forever. John's case was used as precedent for the Illinois Supreme Court case, Giroux v. Giroux, that essentially ends slavery in Illinois. As for Suzette, a year after her son wins his freedom, we see she returns to St. Genevieve. Uh -huh. there you go. Far, she, she's returned to St. Genevieve for the baptism of her sister, Pelagie's son. Suzette is listed as godmother. I imagine on her arrival, Suzette says in sort of assuring, declarative way, I'm here. <laughs> Suzette com uh, completes a circle of her life, returning perhaps only for a visit to where she was born and reunites with her younger sister, Taylor G. Most definitely, Suzette shares her knowledge of law and rights and will soon help guide Taylor G in her own court experiences. 
And for me, I've come to better know Suzette, my ancestor. Suzette is my great, great, great aunt. For some who may not know, in 2009, I discovered that my grandma, my, my own grandmother, Nadine Navarro, who I was very close to, who died at the age of 92, who was born in St. Genevieve, was African American. And I never knew it. For me, this discovery was absolutely magnificent. Haley G., Suzette's sister, is my great, great, great grandmother. And as some of you know, I, I created a, an educational website, an iPad app, to tell Haley G's story. But I have to say that my most treasured discovery in this journey was meeting my cousins, my African-American cousins in St. Louis nine years ago, Pat Watt and Rita Washington. Pat is here with us again today. Uh, I want to say uh, Suzette now is very visible to me in, in the large backdrop of U.S. history. She never wanted anyone's help. All she wanted was her freedom to join the broader community that she helped build, to be a part of a more complete American story. I imagine she had a strong presence, and sometimes words aren't enough to express the fullness of a person a fullness we all possess, and how we move through difficult relationships, difficult circumstances. So I created a very short four minute video I'd like to leave with you to try to push out what Suzette may have been feeling at the time, her superpower, an internal strength that stoked her fire, that fueled her train above her name. And after uh, the video, I'll take some questions, but I, I, I think I've way used up my time. So, so <laughs> let me.
smoothly, but uh, that's what happens when you, you don't come from this, you don't do this as a metier, right? <laughs> Was there anything in, in the resources that you looked at that said who helped them on that undergrad journey? Here. So that's that's a good question, and I, 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 I in my experience, I try to uh, I try to focus on on what they did, you know, because it, it's so easy. Like for example, there's a lot of famous people in this. I mean, famous in those times. These are really powerful people, and I didn't on purpose sort of give the focus to them. But like for example, Joseph Charles Jr. was was her was their attorney, and so people could jump quickly. Oh wow, you have Joseph Charles, who's the son of. Joseph Charles, who was the abolitionist, kind of first paper owner of, uh, in St. Louis, uh, it takes the focus off because uh, it was really the, the, who was risking their lives. So they were helped in the sense that yeah, you have to bring them through the, the court system. It's amazing because they couldn't read or write. But what's so cool about these documents, you rarely have this kind of information to hear the words of an African American. It's so rare at this time. So these court documents documents are valuable. But yes, uh, people did come in their lives, and uh, there's an interesting connection uh, with Charlotte. Uh, yes? Apropos of probably nothing, but the Pensinel House in St. Louis is about to be... I didn't even know there was one. Oh, mm -hmm. I didn't even know there was one. Oh, there is. Wow. It's a two-story log house. It's about to be probably burned down for the story. I can't find any room wow. to take it there. <laughs> There, there it is. Yeah, I'd love to know that information because uh, I do want to, I've done a lot of research on the people that were the enslavers and because I find their characters just as interesting, but I don't know that. Do you know where she's there? Is, is there any record of her burial? You know, that's, I haven't found it yet, unfortunately. We know she came home to St. Jen, but I, my sense is that she's probably still indentured and it may have been a temporary time, but, but we don't know. You know, I don't have the information. I'd love for somebody to find that out. You know, we all do research, but. Uh, she was indentured, you know, in the, the slavery period, I think if the, <coughs> your mother was free, you did you free, or, or your father was free, there, was, there were certain rules about right. how freedom got passed down. I wasn't aware, did you pass down indentures the same way? Yeah, well, my, my sense is, because I read one document talking about how the indenture was passed down, and that's how she kept her value. So that's how I found out, and I haven't, again, I'm talking about her children. Her children. Uh, yeah. Right. <coughs> Were they indentured? Yeah, that's interesting, and again, it, it depends on how, in Illinois, in the time period, people were still trying to hold on to enslavement because of the value there. So we look at what the law is, and then we look at what people got away with, and we can see this, particularly with Ponsonneau, that we really see that he really, and, he, and the witnesses say on these documents in court saying, not only did I do this, but it was my right to do this. So it's the perception of this. So when we, it gets kind of complicated in the sense that, yeah, the law is saying one way, but the thing is they interpret the law probably at the clearest point because they end up starting to win these cases. So to me, it was like, wow, they're the heart of true democracy in American courts at the beginning of time. So. Uh, so yeah. How about what they did on the attorney? Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. So there's 300 courts, but I encourage y'all to, yeah, to to read those books if you have a chance. But, yes, sir. Question. Yes, I think he does, but I'm, again, I'm not, I'm not going to be able to recall, but I think he does. <coughs> the thing I find interesting, he's writing it in 1855, right. 1854 sort of thing. Right. So already it's things are moving. Right. He, he was on the wrong side of, of right. the votes and he realized he should be on the other side, right. a true politician. Right. But uh, <laughs> if there was, I think there was maybe just a couple of lines. I kind of underlined his book, but I, I would have, we'd have to relook at that again. But, uh, Great. I just had a question. When was the indenture outlawed? In the new constitution of 1848, I think, is when it finally ended. Mm. Yeah. Okay, well, 50 years of indenture, I mean, that's a long time. 
Yeah, yeah. and again, we have to look at it as, as, as human property. We, go, we take time back. Now we realize everything. We try to humanize these stories because at that time they it wasn't uh, they didn't see them as human, so they just saw it as a value. So the longer the better, I guess. In this case. But anyway, I've taken enough time. Thank you very much.